This week, we're looking at a truly beautiful, famous painting from Paris, the Bal du Moulin de la Galette by Renoir, which is from the Musée d'Orsay. It's considered a masterpiece of Impressionist painting. So, what is Impressionism? Impressionism, quite simply, could be described as accurately portrayed light, combined with uh, visible, uh, quite harsh, sometimes quite short, brush strokes with quite thickly applied paint. That's very different to, for example, the way that classical paintings uh, are painted with uh, a much more kind of blended technique. Uh, what we'll do first though is we'll look at some of Renoir's early paintings and see how he developed his style. Renoir was born in uh, 1841 in Limoges, which is in the centre of France. And when he's only three years old, his parents decide to move to Paris, which is a good idea for him. Uh, and they move actually to a, an excellent position within the city. They move to uh, Rue de Argenteau, which is one or two blocks away from the Louvre. So for him, it's brilliant. Uh, he, he goes to art school uh, at about 20 years old uh, and ends up in the company of none other than Claude Monet amongst others, and so no doubt becomes influenced by Monet probably almost straight away. It's pretty tough for young painters in Paris at this time, because one of their only options to get their paintings viewed is for the pictures to be put up for what's known as the Paris Salon, which is a, an annual exhibition every year. It takes place in the Louvre. And it was very normal for young painters to have their p paintings rejected from the salon. And that's a problem that many of the young Impressionists had. Indeed, they were sort of ridiculed all the time. Uh, people felt that their style of painting was uh, awful and sort of insult to the grand uh, history of painting itself. And they all had this problem, uh, and we'll see this. But... The picture that you're looking at now uh, by Renoir, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, is of a friend of his called Lys. It's called Lys with a parasol. And it, it predates Impressionism by several years. So the date of this picture is 1867. If you look at the way, for example, the dress is painted, it still looks like classical romantic painting in the sense that the form is still all there. Uh, the brush strokes are not individually visible. He's still using lighting effects that have been left over from a couple of centuries ago. And it shows really no uh, sort of slant towards Impressionism whatsoever. And in that sense, it is a good example of uh, Renoir's early work. It's a very beautiful picture, but certainly this painting... Um, that they that they found it impossible to sell their pictures. That's one of the biggest problems that the early Impressionists had. This picture was painted in 1872. So in the context of his life and career, this is two years before the first Impressionist art exhibition in Paris. So it's important in that it's a sort of lead up. And we can see uh, definitely a development uh, in terms of the style of Impressionism, so the much sharper, harsher brush strokes, uh, the wonderful play of light on the buildings. He would have had to have been outside uh, looking at this image for several days before he actually painted it, because he did actually paint most of the uh, picture in a single day. He got permission to use the um, upstairs room of a cafe just opposite the river here and uh, stayed there all day. He had an assistant with him, actually, and the assistant apparently is painted. So we can see, actually, the guy, the, I think it's this guy here, who is painted several times on the bridge. And what he's doing is he's stopping people on the bridge for a few minutes so that Renoir's got time to paint them all. The bridge itself is, is uh, its name is the Pont Neuf, which means the new bridge. But in reality, of course, it's the oldest bridge in Paris. It had a bit of a delay in construction, but it was actually finished uh, during the reign of King Henry IV. You can see his statue there. But 
It is a fantastic painting. Uh, it's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And it's interesting because, of course, it's, uh, as I just said already, it's a lead up to the development of his Impressionist style. This is the catalogue. So this is the cover of the catalogue for the first Impressionist art exhibition. And it runs in um, for one month between April and May 1874. And we can see the address here for those of you that know Paris. It's this street here, Boulevard de Capucine. And that's the street that runs from the opera building in Paris down to the Madeleine Church. And this is down on the left-hand side, about a third of the way down. And the exhibition was up on the top floor of the building. Renoir shows this painting, uh, which is called the Theatre Box, La Loge from 1874, so he painted. It was a part of, it, like one of his contributions, the exhibition. Uh, this painting today is in the Courtauld Gallery in London. We can see the fabulous clothes that this couple have got on. And if we look at the chap, he's got um, a pair of binoculars. Because going to the theatre or the opera back then was... Uh, very important it was like a very important show i mean people spent all their time looking at other people in the audience which is what he's doing there of course he's not looking at the stage he's actually looking at other people because it's very odd concept for us today but in those days they never closed the house lights down so the performers were carrying on with presumably half the audience ignoring them they were too busy looking at other people in the audience uh, so actually what you wore uh, to the theatre was uh, incredibly important. And it's bizarre that it just got laughed at by people. Actually, this painting itself was, uh, it was criticised, but not to the extent that some other paintings in the exhibition were. The reason why they were there, though, is because they were finding it increasingly difficult to have their paintings exhibited at the Salon in Paris. They were rejected and laughed at and they decided to adopt this title here, so the Anonymous Society. And it was a group of pa pa uh, the painters, Claude Monet, Degas, Renoir, Berthe Morisot, etc. And some of the criticism was incredible. For example, this is an exhibition of the intransigent in the Boulevard de Capucine, or rather, you might say, of the lunatics, of which I have already given you a report. If you would like to be amused and have a moment to spare, don't miss it. It seems amazing. Moving forward, this is a beautiful painting by Claude Monet, and it looks to me like it's actually painted from high up of number 35 looking towards the opera and anyway the criticism of this painting is as follows and that's what I look like when I walk along the boulevard to Capucine good heavens are you trying to make fun of me by any chance that's in referring to a line which says uh, that's impressionism or I don't know what it is, but will you kindly tell me what all those little black dribbles are at the bottom of the picture mean? Uh, so, that's the type of criticism the painter's got. It seems in incredible, really. Everyone, if you can see this image, this is a map of the uh, Montmartre area of Paris. So just to give you a clue about what's going on here, this is the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur which has only uh, started its construction in 1875. So when Renoir moves into the area uh, the following year, it would have been a total building site here. So he's used to having drinks and dancing over here. This over here is the Moulin de la Galette, which is a former mill, but now has become a dance hall and a bar. And it's on... A, uh, a street called Rue Le Pique. Now, it used to be a mill, but uh, it was abandoned because 
the mills of Saint-Denis, which is a little bit north of the city, have only recently been constructed. And so all a lot of the uh, those sorts of businesses around Montmartre have gone into uh, dissolution, I suppose. So it's been transformed into a bar, and this is where everybody goes dancing. And Renoir is really keen on this, so he goes probably at least twice a week to go and look at the dancing and enjoy themselves. Sunday appeared to be the day where everybody did go. And he gets the idea that he'd really like to paint the dancing and does some sketching there. And then the idea starts developing in his mind. So he actually moves house from, from where he was in Boulevard Saint-Georges and moves to here. This is Rue Courtois. And actually where he took lodgings is now a museum in Montmartre, that's the Musée de Montmartre. Uh, de Montmartre. So he's got a pretty short walk to go from there to Moulin de, Moulin de la Galette. This painting, which is called The Swing, or in, uh, in French, Le Ballon Croix, uh, is in the Musée d'Orsay along with Moulin de la Galette. And it's important because we can see that it's it's very similar stylistically so it's a you might we, we might call it a preparation painting and Renoir is using a model here who's a 15 year old girl this is Jeanne Samurai who uh, initially her mother was not at all keen on her being used as a model by Renoir for his pictures and uh, the, the mother chaperoned Jean uh, to his first meeting with Renoir. And uh, she sat there for half the day whilst Renoir painted her. And it's clear that Jean didn't really like this chaperoning and she was quite stroppy with her mother. But the mother realised actually that Renoir was probably no threat to her daughter and allowed her to model for Renoir by herself. And this picture was painted in the gardens let's just go back here so it would have been painted in the garden here probably if you can see where my red dot is and it is very similar as I said stylistically to Moulin de Galette because of the the way the brush strokes are so the the very sort of sharp application of paint and the wonderful light that comes through uh, lighting up everything particularly let, let's look at the back of this jacket here these two guys here are these are painters these are friends of Renoir and moving forward here's the famous painting itself I think I think of all the paintings I've seen and it's it, it's very interesting to see people's reaction when you walk into the museum in the Musée d'Orsay and see this painting because other people just smile at it when they see it for the first time. And that's almost always a reaction to it, which is really which is really nice. It is actually a fair bit bigger than you think. The painting is six foot across and four and a half feet uh, tall, so it's pretty big. It's also in great condition, so a lot of the colours are still very vibrant. And we can see clearly that it's a pretty complicated composition that he's designed here but it he's made it look very simple and as one would expect by now from what he's been doing he's included many of his friends uh, in this composition so let's take a look at who they are well this lady here this is the same girl that we've just seen in the picture before. This is uh, Jean Samurai. But this is her slightly elder sister. This is Estelle. And she's taken the prime position for the modelling here. And then Renoir has got a couple of his uh, painter friends here. So uh, this is a guy called Pierre Frank Lamy. And this is Norbert Gonut. And this guy here, this is Georges Riviere, who is a, what, what is he, a civil servant. But he's also sort of helper to Renoir. So 
Renoir uh, sets up his own concert actually in in this uh, dancing hall area uh, a, a little bit later as a sort of charity project to help out some of the poorer people. And I suppose that's one of the issues here whereby people were quite poor, even though they looked like they were wearing fantastic dresses. Uh, what they were doing was looking at some of the more expensive Paris fashions and then using cheaper material to work up the same styles. So they were living in pretty poor conditions. Um, Montmartre had just um, over, well, the whole city of Paris had really just come out of a pretty difficult time in French history, the end of the Franco-Prussian War. But there was a certain optimism a few years later because the end of that was like 1871. And this was the start of what might be known as, as, as the Belle Epoque, which was a period of time very creative between the end of the Franco-Prussian War and the beginning of the First World War, when there were lots of great writers, lots of great paintings uh, that came in Paris during that time. Other people we can look at um, this here is a Cuban painter, from, uh, well, Spanish painter from Cuba, sorry, who is living in Pigal, which is just at the bottom of the hill. And his name is Cardenas. Uh, and these fantastic trousers he's got on there. And then his dancing partner is a local dancer. Her name is Margot. But as an example of the fragility of these people's lives, this lady here, uh, she dies of tuberculosis about a year after the painting is completed. This girl here, this is uh, a model called Angèle, and Renoir uses her in several of his paintings. And these figures here are various different artists and models that he would have worked with. So the picture, of course, is, is very well loved. Um, just to say again, the treatment of light is quite brilliant, whereby uh, filtering through the leaves of the trees above them, we can see the light beautifully lighting up almost every surface of the painting. In the background, we can see there's a band playing. And down here on the table, everyone is drinking the local speciality, which is pomegranate juice. So they're dancing for hours on a Sunday afternoon. Um, it would have been great fun. It would have been... I, I suppose the sort of highlight of people's week, no doubt, to something similar to what it would be today. There are actually two versions of this painting. This is by far the bigger one. The next version here that you can see has had a more problematic history. And art historians are divided on the fact of whether this was the original that he worked on outside or whether this is the original. Now, one thing that we do know is that Renoir actually took this massive piece of canvas to work on outside, and he drew huge crowds when he set the canvas up and started working on it. And he really worked on it for the whole of the summer of 1876, which by all accounts was a very hot summer in Paris. So it took him several months to paint it. And the locals had never really seen this before. They'd never seen a painter working outside. So it would have been a, a, a great experience for them, no doubt. And Georges Riviere uh, would have helped him carry the canvas back to his uh, apartment at the end of the day. So one of the reasons why we're confused about this picture is because if it's... It, it, it's clear that this is like a kind of faster work. So look, look at the what, look at the way the brushwork is here. It's very sort of fast and quick. It's also quite a bit smaller. Uh, and there's real no there, there's actually no other evidence that this is the that, that this is the painting that he worked on outside. But the picture has had a strange history because um, it's it's not on uh, public view. It was for those of you old enough to remember. It was at one time the world's most expensive painting when it was bought by a, a Japanese businessman uh, for a vast sum of money, something like $50 million, I can't remember. And then 
it ended up in uh, the vault of a Japanese bank because th this guy went bankrupt and then it was sold on to pay his creditors to a private Swiss collector. So uh, art historians don't really know, but they think and suspect that it's in Switzerland, uh, which is obviously a genuine shame. Because of course, that means that we really don't know when we're likely to see it again. That's one of the problems when very famous paintings are in private hands. Uh, of course, unfortunately, a very good example of this today is the world's most expensive painting ever, which is the Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci, which uh, we don't even know who owns it, but it's been bought by probably someone in Qatar. And um, who knows when we'll see that picture again. Okay, well, from this point onwards, Renoir becomes um, certainly more popular and that means that he begins to be selling more paintings, uh, makes him wealthier, and he's able to start traveling. He goes to Rome uh, to see the work of Raphael, and also he goes to Venice to see the work of Titian. And um, he particularly, in his first trip actually, is to Madrid in Spain to see the work of Diego Velasquez. And what that does is it uh, really influences his style in a different way, so a couple of paintings I'll show you now where uh, just a few years after this, he actually moves away from the sort of quite harsh brushstrokes of Impressionism and moves back into uh, more of a sort of classicism. So here's an example, this picture he took ages over actually. This is the Grand Bathers uh, from Philadelphia Museum of Art where it is now. And he started this in 1884 and took three years over it. Um, and we can see straight away that the modelling of the figures is, is very different. It's very precise and blended in a way that his former paintings during the Impressionist period were not. Again, we can see some very familiar faces. Uh, this is his soon-to-be wife, Aline, you can see there. And then this on the left is a model that he used a lot. It's also a contemporary of She was a painter too. That's Suzanne Valadon. This, pic this, this picture is pretty big. It's five and a half by four feet. And I suppose it becomes typical of Renoir's later style, um, which some, some people don't like. They think his later pictures are, uh, to use a, a sort of cliche, a bit sort of chocolate boxy. But nevertheless, this is the style that he moves into later. This painting may be an exception. Uh, he did several of these beautiful dancing images. This, this painting is in uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Art. Uh, it's called The Dance at Bougival, which is, um, that village is north of Paris. So it's where people used to go for a bit of a drink and a dance on the weekend. And certainly I think the... Um, the curators in Boston say that this is one of the most popular paintings in the gallery, and you can understand why. There's actually uh, many of Renoir's many, many paintings are in the United States. He was very prolific, actually, as a painter. He completed something like 4,000 paintings. So any biography of him is only going to give you a sort of overview of what he did, the most famous paintings. But this one is, is beautiful because there's wonderful application of colour. And a bit of a close-up here. Look at these people enjoying a drink that's wonderfully painted. And there are a few of them like this, as I said. Uh, I think also one of the reasons why we might like this is because there's nothing complicated about it. Many... Artists, for example, we looked a few weeks ago at Picasso's Guernica, and there's a lot of symbolism in pictures like that. But this one, this simply isn't. So it's uh, accessible and enjoyable for many. This is Renoir uh, towards the end of his life. He, he actually lives to be quite an old man. He, he's 81 when he dies. Uh, so this uh, photo is taken about 10 years before his death. And he struggled... A lot with arthritis and I suppose if, if we look we can see that his fingers are and knuckles there are 
uh, a bit deformed. Uh, he, he, I mean, there's apocryphal stories that he uh, strapped paintbrushes to his wrist, but there's no actual evidence of this. Um, but anyway, here we look, uh, here we finish uh, ha having seen the, the, this man's beautiful paintings. Uh, hopefully that's a, a good overview of his most famous pictures. Next week, we'll be looking at a wonderful painting from London, uh, The Fighting Temeraire by Turner. Um, after all, his paintings hugely influenced the work of Claude Monet when he came to London. So we will be looking at this wonderful painting next week.